Francisco. We, we are delighted to have you with us this morning. Just a couple of reminders, please stay on mute throughout the entirety of the presentation. If you feel um, comfortable, please turn your camera on. It makes for a more community oriented event and we love to see everyone. Also, you can type your questions in the chat box and we will get to them um, as time allows at the end of the program. So again, thank you for joining us and it's my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Friedman. Thank you so much, Hillary. And welcome all. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Jonathan Friedman. I'm the uh, director of the Jewish Museum of the American West, which is an online museum that you can visit at any time from home, which is very convenient these days. And I'm also the president of the Western States Jewish History Association. And when I'm not doing those things, I'm the Associate Dean of the Master of Jewish Studies program at the Academy for Jewish Religion in California, Los Angeles, which is a transdenominational seminary. So what do all these things mean? We'll get into some of the history, I thought it might be interesting for you, of our organization, the Western States Jewish History Association and the museum. I can give you some tips in terms of how to navigate our, um, online museum as well. So hopefully we'll uh, be able to tour the museum proper together. But I thought I'd share with a little bit of context in terms of what an organization like ours focuses on, where we started, why we exist. Because in truth, there are Jewish historical societies around the country. We are one of them. There's one in Chicago. There are um, dozens of them across the United States. So I'm gonna share my screen one moment. So as you can see here, um, you can visit our website, jmaw.org. <clears throat> Hopefully easy to remember, Jewish Museum of the American West, jmaw.org um, at any time, because we are a fully online museum uh, created to be an online museum, really without aspirations to be on the ground for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the benefits, obviously, is that we don't have to worry about renting space, um, but we also don't have to worry about space constraints. Our website has uh, regular exhibits. That is, um, once an exhibit is up there, it's permanent, and we have over 600 exhibits on different uh, personalities and institutions in the American West uh, with some Jewish connection. And specifically, the, what we call the pioneer period from the 1840s to the earliest decades of the 1900s, the 20th century. So where did all this interest begin? <clears throat> As I mentioned, there are a number of Jewish historical societies across the country. And they all emerged, or at least not, I, I shouldn't say all of the organizations emerged, but the enthusiasm and the movement for such organizations began in 1954. That was a very important year, the tercentenary uh, of the Jewish presence, the 300th anniversary of the Jewish presence in the United States, commemorated uh, in that year of 1954 was the 1654 arrival of America's first Jewish community, consisting of 23 Jews of Spanish Portuguese descent who left Brazil for New Amsterdam, now New York, and formed Congregation Sherith Israel. That is the beginning that historians note of the Jewish communal presence in the United States. It doesn't mean that there weren't individual Jews or even families who were in the United States prior, but 1654 was the first concerted effort to have a Jewish communal institu institution. So the tercentenary celebration was initiated by the American Jewish Historical Society, which formed a 300 member organizing committee. And this committee provided guidance, programming, 
information and traveling exhibits for over 400 celebrations held in Jewish communities across the United States. So in anticipation of this tercentenary and also in its aftermath, we see the emergence of <clears throat> uh, Jewish historical associations. And they are either uh, local, meaning maybe a city or um, you know, a, a regional area. They can be state organizations. They can be even pan-regional as ours is uh, representing all of the states west of the Mississippi. That's the Western States Jewish History Association. But the first such organization was the Rhode Island Jewish Historical Association founded in 1951. And as you'll see, um, I have a few examples of these groups. Um, they do tend to publish research. This is a major aspect of the endeavor to disseminate information, to collect it, um, you know, and make it available to the broader Jewish community and broader community in general. So this is reflected in this particular mission statement to procure, collect, and preserve books, records, pamphlets, letters, manuscripts, prints, photographs, paintings, and other historical material relating to the history of Jews of Rhode Island, to encourage and promote the study of such history by lectures and otherwise, and to publish and diffuse information as to such history. So you can replace Rhode Island with any of these other locations and regions, and you get the idea. There are a number of uh, prongs to this effort. And really what it amounts to is not only reminding Jews or um, sort of giving Jews comfort that they have a place in the history of the particular area that they may inhabit, but also to show others beyond the Jewish community that the Jews are an integral part of not only American history broadly, but the history of the particular area. So as you can see, the Southern California Jewish Historical Society was the next to be founded in 1952. Our group, the Western States Jewish History Association actually grew out of um, the Southern California group. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the Chicago Jewish Historical Society was founded in 1977. Again, the mission statements for these various organizations do tend to um, resonate with one another. So I just took some of these beautiful logos from the different organizations to show the diversity of, of these groups. <clears throat> there are, as I mentioned, dozens of organizations, but we have Washington State, Orange County in, in uh, Southern California, uh, the Jewish Historical Society of New Jersey, we have Indiana, Dallas, the Jewish Historical Society of Greater Hartford, the Upper Midwest. So as I mentioned, it could be a city, a state, a region, etc. And our group uh, takes a little bit of a different approach, <clears throat> the Western States Jewish History Association. There is a Chicago um, tie here or uh, an angle and that is with our founder, our, or with the founder of the organization that gave rise to the uh, Western States Jewish History Association, that is Justin Turner. The Western States Jewish History Association has roots in the Southern California Jewish Historical Society, <clears throat> which was founded in 1952 by Justin G. Turner, a Chicago-born attorney, investment executive, historian, author, and collector of Lincolniana, the uh, basically collection of Lincoln material. Uh, he was quite prolific in that area as a collector and historian. And his book, Mary Todd Lincoln, Her Life and Letters, published in 1972, which he co-authored with his daughter-in-law, Linda Levitt Turner, is considered among the 100 essential Lincoln books. Now, if you know anything about historians' interest in Lincoln, it is quite vast. I think there are 14,000 books written about Lincoln. So to be in the top 100 is really saying something. And um, in fact, this made such um, an impact at the time that Jerome Kilty based uh, a play 
that he um, that he wrote called Look Away that premiered at the New York uh, City Playhouse Theater in January of 1973. Among other things, uh, Justin Turner was a collector of art as well. And this particular piece uh, is notable, <clears throat> and I thought I'd share it with you. It's one of the highlights, I think, of our uh, museum is a bit of a exhibit on this particular artwork. But uh, there was a gentleman named Solomon Nunez Carvalho, uh, who in 1853, 1854, um, went from uh, Charleston, South Carolina, as the photographer for jo uh, John Charles Fremont's fifth exploring expedition, which journeyed through Kansas, Colorado, and Utah in search of a railroad route to the Pacific Ocean. He, by the way, uh, Carvalho kept a very detailed diary of the trip, of the expedition. And he, for instance, became very ill when he was in Utah and was nursed back to health by very helpful Mormons in um, Salt Lake City, very colorful um, description of all that happened. But Carvajal was also an accomplished painter. And this is really his most famous work. It's Abraham Lincoln and Diogenes from 1865, based on a widely circulated photograph of Lincoln from February of 1861. This was apparently painted during Lincoln's lifetime. Um, that was, of course, a very uh, momentous year in Lincoln's life. But here we have Lincoln pictured here. Um, this is a Romanesque statue of George Washington in the background. And here's Diogenes. And the Greek legend is that Diogenes was searching around the world looking for one enlightened person. So he went around with his lamp and just scoured the earth looking for this one individual. So here he is finding that one person, happens to be Abraham Lincoln, and his lamp has fallen from his hand because he's so surprised. This particular painting is the only known uh, painting of Lincoln by a Jewish artist that was painted during Lincoln's lifetime. And this has a connection here because the painting itself was acquired by Turner and gifted to Brandeis University in 1958. So among other things, the Southern California Society and later the Western States Jewish History Association um, has been active around the Los Angeles area uh, because that's where we've been located so many years, doing different uh, commemorations and historical um, markings around the city. So for instance, this is a marker that can be found still to this day um, at the site of the first Jewish location uh, that is communal location in Los Angeles. And it happens to be the Jewish cemetery at Chavez Ravine, which was established in 1855. If you know anything about baseball, and I'm sure many of you do, that is now the site of Dodger Stadium and has been since 1961. But this particular um, cemetery was the first Jewish project really in Los Angeles. It was established by the Hebrew Benevolent Society in 1855. And that society was the first uh, charitable organization in Los Angeles. That will become a theme as we look broadly at the American West. Um, in many places, including Los Angeles, which wasn't much of a city back in 1854, <clears throat> um, the Jewish settlers who came would be among the first to establish charity organizations, uh, first for themselves and then secondarily extending to other people in the community. Um, if you've been to Los Angeles, you may know Cantor's Deli which is in the Fairfax area. And uh, in 1985, the Southern California uh, Jewish Historical Society sponsored the uh, painting that we see here, the mural, which gives the detailed 
a history of Los Angeles Jewry from 1854 to the time when this was painted. So just another example of what societies like ours do. So this is where the museum really has its unofficial start way back in 1968. This gentleman is Norton B. Stern. He was an optometrist, a religious school principal, and a pioneer amateur historian of Jews in the American West. And he approached the Southern California Jewish Historical Society in 1968 with the idea of starting a quarterly journal. Stern himself had been looking for a venue to launch this project and saw the organization as a logical choice to sponsor his work. He had been, as, a, as is mentioned here, a very prolific and very enthusiastic um, retriever of the Jewish presence in Southern California, Northern California specifically, but also extending uh, beyond California at a certain point as well. And he had this vision of a Western States Jewish Historical Quarterly, which began as a concept of kind of the general um, understanding of what the Western States are, that is west of the Mississippi, but as the years would go on, and this journal would be published for 50 years, it would extend to parts of Mexico, Canada, uh, the Pacific Rim, even into uh, places like India and Japan, just depending on the subject matter. Um, kind of an interesting understanding of what the Western states means. It's more of a concept or an ethos than perhaps even a geographical location. We can talk a little bit about that perhaps later on. But 1968 was an important year. <clears throat> in uh, Jewish kind of uh, ethnic self-awareness in the United States, coming in the exuberant aftermath of the Six-Day War and inspired by the decade's ethnic pride movements, such as the Black Power Movement, Red Power Movement, Chicano Movement, etc., the time seemed ripe for a journal whose implicit message was one of Jewish pride. So just as a side note, one area that organizations such as ours have historically neglected are kind of the unsavory stories, right? We love to celebrate the prominent Jews who were successful, um, who had upstanding um, uh, reputation, the community, who were contributors in the, you know, with a capital C to the formation of different areas um, and were really instrumental in the history of these um, locations, the kind of big names. But of course, that means a lot of people who were less successful, perhaps less um, upstanding, were left out. Um, so some of the trends that we see in the broader field of history to recover the forgotten people, even the important individuals who were left out because they happened to be women or happened to be from the wrong community or the wrong side of town. That's more of a modern um, impulse. In Stern's day, it was really about Jewish pride. That's what that means. So nevertheless, he started out with $500 and sponsorship from the Southern California Society. And he went on to edit some 93 issues before his death in 1992, the last one when he was quite ill. This is his colorful partner, Rabbi William Kramer. Uh, if you're, if you have a connection to Southern California, you may have heard about him. He was quite a known personality in the area. Uh, Stern, on the other hand, was quite reserved. He was happy to do research independently and just sort of follow his own interests. Kramer was much more of a public figure, and this. Um, this photo is actually a case in point. This was from a, an advertisement for a bagel shop. Here he is looking like maybe a quintessential rabbinic figure holding the bagel with his prominent Star of David ring. They use that to sell bagels. And he actually portrayed rabbis on television as well. Law and Order, I think he was on an episode of that and other um, ventures. But nevertheless, 
he was um, brought on as the associate editor of the quarterly in the spring of 1971. And he was a reform rabbi. He served local synagogues, uh, Temple Israel of Hollywood, Temple uh, Beth Emmet in Burbank, and also was very instrumental in Jewish education, founding chair of the School of Education at the Hebrew Union College campus in Los Angeles. He taught at UCLA, USC, the University of Judaism, which is now the American Jewish University, and was a tenured professor of religious studies at California State University, Northridge as well. And he practiced law and he was a marriage and family and child counselor and probably did other things that I'm overlooking as well. So between the two of them, Stern and Kramer, um, they had a really prolific and, and instrumental run with this journal, the Western States Jewish History Journal, which they managed to keep up uh, for many, many years. After Kramer retired, um, it was handed over to another group, uh, two individuals, David Epstein and Gladys Sturman. And the, in total, the, the uh, journal lasted for 50 years as a quarterly, which is quite remarkable. In fact, after the first issue came out back in 1968, Kramer and Stern uh, got a letter from uh, an interested reader who was curious if they had enough material to continue with a second issue. And lo and behold, they continue with 50 more years. So the Western States Jewish History Association uh, actually contentiously broke away, I certainly won't get into the details, from the Southern California Jewish Historical Society in 1983. And the new association, the Western States Jewish History Association, positioned itself as a pan-local or pan-regional society rather than concentrating on one city or state. Its net was cast across the American West, including the Midwest, and eventually spread to uh, parts of Mexico, Canada, and the Pacific Rim. Rather than organizing public events, the organization really focused on research and the publication of the Western States Jewish History Journal. I recently uh, updated our 50 year index and these are some of the observations that I made. Over the 50 years, there have been uh, two, two, thousand articles that were published during the journal's first 50 years. Uh, we'll talk about the relaunch in a moment. But as you can see, I'm not going to go through all these numbers. Most of the interest has been on California because of our location and certainly because of Kramer and Stern's own um, research interests in Northern and Southern California. But we have also contributed to other areas, as you can see, Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Hawaii, et cetera, and um, even beyond the United States. This is part of what you will see on our website uh, when you visit, and I'll show you how this works in a little while. Um, you'll see that there are a number of exhibition halls, each of them containing personalities and institutions, et cetera, in these different regional areas quite easy to navigate. Now, why is this important? From looking at that 50 year index and all of the work that has been done in this area, uncovering these stories that really don't see the light of day outside of the Jewish interest in them, we've been able to reconstruct or really revise the narrative. When you think about the history of American Jewry, it often has an East Coast, New York even, uh, centered Northeastern focus, meaning that there are typically understood to be three waves of immigration, first Sephardic during the colonial period, then um, a wave of German Jewry that came um, in the earlier part of the 19th century. And then that was followed by the very massive influx of Eastern European Jews toward the end of the 19th century and early 20th century. And <clears throat> that's only part of the story because there were also 
during these times, uh, Jews who did venture westward, and they were a different kind of Jew uh, for the most part, especially in the early years. Again, the pioneer period being the mid 1800s to early 1900s. Unlike those who would stay in Europe or the East Coast, Jews who went west were typically less observant, meaning that they weren't as concerned about kashrut, the kosher laws. They weren't as concerned about having a synagogue nearby. Most of them didn't, at least in the early years when they were just a few families in an area, not enough interest to have a synagogue. Um, having a mikvah wasn't, wasn't a deal. If uh, these Jews wanted to keep some semblance of kashrut, they tended to eat eggs, actually. And there was a uh, kind of a euphemism that was thrown around in those days of egg eaters. These would be Jews who didn't eat the local meat because it wasn't kosher, but did eat eggs. So that's a subgroup of the Western Jews, but many of them, and we have uh, diary entries and memoirs from some of these Western pioneers talk about you know, tasting pork for the first time and not being, you know, struck by a lightning bolt and that kind of thing. And then just kind of acclimating to whatever area they were. Essentially commerce and, um, you know, opportunity outweighed whatever ritual concerns might have hampered them. Again, this was a unique crop of Jews who were less um, inclined to keeping the older patterns. The, another interesting thing is that tolerance was an early attribute that was encountered in the Western states. There was, especially in the early years before um, other white immigrants started to come in from uh, places in the Midwest in particular and kind of brought some of their um, hangups, let's say, there really wasn't much anti-Semitism in the far West uh, in particular, meaning that these were immigrants in towns of immigrants. And, you know, if you had a, a German accent, even if you spoke Yiddish, you were just considered a German. And what really mattered was, you know, do you have the materials at your dry goods store on your push cart that I need? And in fact, Jews and Jewish owned businesses would establish quite good reputations for being reliable um, brokers, reliable dealers. Indeed, many of the early banks in the American West were established by Jewish immigrants who were entrusted with, in the gold rush country, for instance, entrusted with um, keeping gold, excess gold from some of these miners, and banks would develop out of that. So it's kind of the opposite story than we might hear of, you know, no Jews allowed and that kind of stuff, which um, does, unfortunately, uh, color some of American Jewish history. There was also quite a bit of interreligious activities um, in many places, including places that you might not expect, like Salt Lake City. Um, in Los Angeles, for example, many of the early prominent business families who happened to be Jewish were also involved in Catholic charities and the establishment of orphanages and um, Catholic institutions of prayer and learning, et cetera. There was a lot of uh, inter-religious cooperation in the early days. And I mentioned civic commitment as well. Jews were often the first in town to create organizations, usually benevolent societies, and help found charity organizations, hospitals, and fraternal lodges as well. Ironically, in some cases, the lodges that they would create would be you know, Masonic lodges, Odd Fellows, et cetera, and in later years, those same groups that were founded by Jews would not allow Jews to be members. And then at that point, really towards the, the later part of the 19th century, Jews started to develop their own fraternal lodges as an alternative. And that's, you know, not an uncommon story. But again, in the earliest years, um, there really wasn't this recognition of you know, Jews as anything nefarious, and certainly anti-Semitism wasn't much of a factor in most of these places. There was also a lot of decentralization in the West, which came in handy. Because these uh, pioneers were not beholden to the norms of Jewish communal standards, 
or even uh, Jewish communal frameworks as they were perhaps in the East, especially in the East, they were able to venture into areas that uh, they might not have otherwise. It was kind of an open field, so to speak. Um, having your store open on Saturday morning wasn't such a big deal in the West. You know, you just sort of uh, worked around that if you wanted to have Shabbat in some way. These weren't really uh, pressing concerns because there wasn't communal pressure as there might be elsewhere. So where does that leave us now? Um, we're about to get to our museum. So in the 21st century, <clears throat> um, our organization, the Western States Jewish History Association, moved in a more professionalized uh, direction, meaning that uh, for the most part, the historical material that uh, began with Norton Stern was of an amateur nature, certainly high quality for the most part, and um, very detailed and very helpful and very instructive, but at the same time, not affiliated with professional historical standards, professional historical institutions, meaning that the way that, and I certainly won't get into these details, but the way that a, a you know professional paid historian looks at an issue is often quite different than a genealogist or a family historian who's interested in names and dates and places and doesn't necessarily look at context in the way that a, that a trained historian might. So that being said, in the early uh, 2000s, our association partnered with local museums and academic institutions where our archives are now mainly stored. That is the Autry Museum of the American West, the Huntington Library, uh, the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and also American uh, Jewish University. Most of our uh, physical materials are spread throughout these areas. Fortunately, we also, before that was done, we made uh, digital copies of all our historical photographs. We have about 4,000 of those, and those are featured throughout our website. So um, it doesn't hamper our efforts as a museum because we are online to have our kind of decadment to be housed elsewhere because we have more or less what we need. So in 2013, the association created on museum, the Jewish Museum of the American West to make our research more accessible to historians and the general public. And for the most part, the materials on our museum website are drawn from the 50 years of the quarterly journal. Um, so these would be sort of summaries of more expansive research make it accessible to the public. And as the director of the museum, I often uh, receive inquiries, you know, where can we find the rest of, of the story? And I am happy to make scans of, of all of our um, articles and make other materials available um, at no cost to any visitor who uh, wants a little bit more. Finally, in uh, 2021, that would be now, uh, we're still um, in the works, but our journal is in the process of being revived as now a professional peer-reviewed journal uh, by uh, published by Texas Tech University Press. Um, that should be coming out quite soon. Our 51st, 51st uh, volume delayed by a few years in between. And we also um, are trying to balance the professional amateur kind of, um, or I should say popular focus versus the professional focus in our other publications as well. These are just a few of our books that have come out recently. Uh, Jewish Gold Country, which is a photo history of Jews in uh, the Northern Californian gold country. Jewish Los Angeles, also a photo history book. Both of them have about two, 200 um, or so historical photographs with captions and so forth. And finally, the book on the right, uh, Songs of Zonderling. This is a project that I uh, put together with the vice president of our uh, uh, association, John. A more historical study of a very important uh, contributor to Jewish music. Uh, rabbi Zonderling was a German born rabbi who came to Los Angeles during 
um, the 1930s and managed to commission uh, very prominent immigrant composers such as Arnold Schoenberg and others uh, to write for the synagogue during that period. So that's more of a, a you know, detailed historical study. The others are more popular focused. Now, what I would love to do, I'm gonna click out of this and get onto our museum site to give you a sense of how to navigate it, what it's all about. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's always open, it's online. So just wanna give you some pointers and sort of show off some of the aspects. Hope you can see this okay. This is the Jewish Museum of the American West. When you come, you can kiss the mezuzah that we have here. Um, we are, again, a fully online museum, only available on your computer, as it says here. Um, so this is just some more background information here. What's, I think, important to note about the, the museum is, again, there are over 600 exhibits available um, that are permanent. And they are uh, categorized under different regions in these what we call exhibition halls. Um, I recommend if you do visit the museum to check out the uh, Why the Jews section, which gives some information about uh, you know, what is being covered in the rest of the museum. There's an essay here by uh, the museum's founder, David Epstein, who's my predecessor. I didn't mention, but I, I became the president of the association and director of the museum in uh, 2018. And prior to that, David Epstein was the president and founded the museum. Uh, he was involved with the organization for about 25 years uh, before I came around. Um, here you'll see, in addition to some helpful essays to, uh, again, orient you towards the subject matter, <clears throat> we have these letters that you'll see next to some of the, and most of the um, individuals profiled on the site. This is a little helping tool that Epstein created. The I stands for integrity, the H, knowledge of Jewish history, E, education, L, uh, language skills, multi-language skills, and uh, P for philanthropy. So I help is the acronym that he came up with. Because again, we're featuring on this site, the important, you know, maybe lesser known, certainly lesser known, but important contributors to um, the Jewish history in these areas. So they, <clears throat> they do have common threads that tie them together in terms of how they were viewed, um, the kinds of attributes that they had. So um, you'll see these letters and that's what they mean. Anyway, so here are our exhibition halls. So from Alaska up here, all the way down to Washington and interesting points in between, including Hawaii and the Pacific Rim um, and more familiar territory like California. So um, when you click on one of these exhibition halls, you'll see just a cursory kind of um, overview of some of the more notable aspects. This would be Alaska. And then let's see who Isidore Bales was. Jewish pioneer clothing merchant and founding father of Anchorage, Alaska. Bet you didn't know about him. So you can read a little bit about him here. Um, we usually include some historical photographs as well. <clears throat> this is the first city council of Anchorage as an example. And here's a, a little parade. Um, I mentioned we have about 4,000 historical photographs. Much of those are um, featured on the website where possible. Um, so if we go to the California exhibit hall, you'll see that it's much more robust. Um, we have all of these subcategories, Los Angeles, San Fernando Valley, Orange County, Inland Empire, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we also have uh, special exhibitions, which are a lot of fun as well. Um, this is one on French Jews of California. So again, I'm just giving you a sense of what's on the site because you can visit, your, visit yourself and it is quite user-friendly as well. Um, one very important aspect though, 
um, that I often uh, promote. And uh, certainly I think it's one of the more important areas is we do also encourage visitors to submit. So if you have a family member that you think would be appropriate, you know, during this time period, perhaps, um, who, who was a, you know, let's say a, a dry goods salesperson or whatever it might have been, or a rabbi or, you know, you name it, who has some notable qualities. I, I recently helped someone develop one on, you know, the first known Jew of a particular town, that kind of thing. Um, I'm absolutely available to help um, you uh, with constructing that, what that would look like. We also have some uh, guidelines here, but this is our email and it goes directly to me, jmaw uh, curator at gmail.com. You can also reach me by phone. But anyway, um, I do encourage you, if you do have something to share, um, and you know, photographs are always very helpful too, but um, to consider enhancing our site. It's an ever-growing project. Again, we don't have any restraints in, as far as space is concerned or anything like that. So um, we're always hoping to grow. Um, if you, you know, want to add to any existing exhibit, if you have something to share to en en enhance what's already there, that's the other wonderful thing. It's a living, breathing um, platform where you know, what's on there is not necessarily final. I often go in and tweak things and add nuance. And, you know, maybe we forgot a particular family member who should have been included, that kind of thing. But that is our museum. You can get lost here for hours and days. Um, <laughs> it's quite a lot of fun. And again, I think as you, as you move through, a lot of those uh, kind of commonalities that I pointed out in terms of what uh, what were some of the, the linking features, the shared features of Jews who ventured westward? Westward, uh, You will see certainly a lot of um, those attributes um, just in the individual stories and quite surprising, I think, at times. And um, certainly you'll learn something. That's what we're all about. That was really great, Jonathan. Thank you so much. I think, you know, we live in an area where it's not uncommon to see something Jewish or hear something Jewish or find something Jewish. And so um, just the fact that you've collected all, all these things is, is the foresight of the original founders. So we do have a couple of questions. Susan wanted to know where was Congregation Sheriff located in New York? Do, do you know? Yeah, it, it's still there. Um, I don't, I don't want to get it wrong because I, I visited, but I don't remember exactly the, the locale. Um, but yeah, you can, you can look it up. Um, in fact, the, you know, it, it began with just a, a group of families, as was mentioned. Um, it was years and years before they established a building and that had moved several times. So um, that's all, I think all of that information, that historical information will be found on the uh, website of the congregation. One interesting aspect, by the way, if you ever get a chance to to view it online or or in person, is it's kind of a preservationist um, synagogue as well. It it does preserve the customs of Spanish Portuguese Jews from the colonial period. It's really like going back in time when you uh, visit or you know attend a service there. It's quite remarkable. That's all I can say about it, though. Uh, Are there any Jewish ties to President Lincoln? Yeah, you know, I'm sure there are individual Jews. Actually, um, there are a number of stories now that I'm thinking about it. Um, for, for instance, you know, you may be aware that uh, General Grant under Lincoln um, had a, an order to expel Jews from territories that, um, that the Union Army had taken uh, control of under the really false fear that Jews would be traitorous and kind of work both sides because they were involved in um, supplying soldiers and so forth. And they were seen as a threat to stability. Um, Jonathan Sarna, the great historian of American Judaism wrote a book about that um, not too long ago. But 
Lincoln actually um, squashed that uh, effort. And as a result, in fact, uh, he became beloved by Jews. Um, there is even a rumor that spread during Lincoln's lifetime that he himself was Jewish because it was very uncommon for non-Jews to have um, what were called Old Testament or Hebrew Bible names at the time. The fact that he was named Abraham um, was enough for some, for some Jews who really wanted Lincoln to be Jewish to uh, claim him as one of their own. And certainly, as you're probably aware, when, when Lincoln passed away, there were Jewish memorials to him across the country as well. So I'm not sure about family ties um, or anything like that, but I'm, I, I know that he had advisors, um, of course, on the uh, Confederacy side also, there were prominent Jews, um, such as Judah Benjamin, who was the vice president, uh, or in that, that kind of position, I don't know what his, his official title was, but the right-hand man um, to Jefferson Davis in the Confederacy. So we had Jews on both sides, let's be honest. As we do now. Yeah, there you go. Um, what happened, at, Goldie and I both wrote down the same question. Wow. What happened to the graves uh, when they built the uh, stadium, Dodger Stadium? Yeah, that's a great question. So you're probably, well, I don't want to assume anything. Th there was a great controversy when the uh, stadium was, uh, the, when the cornerstone was laid in 1959 and was declared the site of Dodger Stadium. In the years leading up to that, um, it was primarily a Chicano, um, Mexican-American community. And um, there, these days, there's been a lot of, uh, in local press in Los Angeles, sort of a revising or revisiting some of that um, history because uh, there's a celebration, whatever anniversary of uh, Fernando Valenzuela, the, the pitcher for the Dodgers, Fernando Mania, which really was a moment in the 1980s when um, Mexican Jews, of, or not Jews, but uh, Los Angelinos of Mexican heritage were finally um, able to be full hearted fans of the Dodgers because of this fraught history. But when the stadium was um, built, all of the remaining uh, Mexican Americans were kicked out of Chavez Ravine. The Jewish community had already left years and years earlier. So um, in the like around 1905 to 1910 or so, the graves were moved, uh, the interned uh, caskets were moved to East Los Angeles and it became a new uh, Jewish cemetery, the second Jewish cemetery site um, called the Home of Peace. And um, it wasn't under any kind of order that they had to do this. It was just the Jewish community was more centered in that area and it made sense. So it took a number of years to move all of the, all of the caskets, but it did happen. And uh, it wasn't under any kind of uh, duress. So these days, the only thing that's left, and I think you can see it from the parking lot perhaps of Dodger Stadium, is that marker uh, where the, the cemetery used to be. Is there one particular piece of memorabilia that you have on the website or that you might have in a, in a physical collection that is your favorite piece? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, most of our materials are now at these various institutions in the LA area. <clears throat> but I do in my garage have a number of binders of kind of the leftover stuff. Um, my favorite uh, piece, and, and you can, I made an exhibit about it on the website as well. Um, we have a collection of early business cards from uh, pioneers in the San Francisco area, primarily some in Los Angeles as well. Um, these would be, you know, back in the days in the 19th century when a business card was basically you just sign your name on a card and you give it to someone like a calling card. Like, you know, I, I've, you, you would knock on someone's door and the person wouldn't be there and you'd write your name on a card and with some information and give it to that person. Say when, the, when uh, so-and-so gets home, please give them my card. I have one of those from Levi Strauss of the uh, famous jeans company, right? Um, that's probably my favorite thing. People know him, obviously. So I have his handwritten signature on a little business card, which is kind of cool. 
All right. Uh, how many people visit the website in a given year? That is an excellent question. I I don't have the figures. Um, I'm sure I could look that up. Um, that is a really good question. I'm going to investigate. Um, our, website, <laughs> our website is- Didn't mean to make more yeah, work for you. <laughs> our, our website is hosted by a company and I'm sure they keep those kinds of records. I haven't asked because I guess I just haven't. But uh, now that you ask, <laughs> uh, that would be good to know. And Inquiring like where mind. we're visiting from, because interestingly, I get um, inquiries from around the world. You know, um, I'm right now working with a museum in Germany um, that's doing an exhibit on uh, Levi Strauss and his connections across the world. Um, so it's been really wonderful in that sense um, because we're online and because it's so accessible, I've been able to uh, collaborate with so many different organizations, including uh, the Smithsonian Institution and other, you know, very, very important um, entities. And we're just this little online thing. So it's, it's a source of pride uh, for that. For that reason, it's quite a pleasure to do this. Well, we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Just a reminder, we have the last film in our Chicago Loves Israel film series this weekend. It is the fifth heaven. And we will be meeting with um, Iran Rickless and Dina Svi Rickless, the uh, filmmakers of those films on Sunday morning. You can visit our website jccchicago.org for more information on that program and all the other programs. Jonathan, again, thank you so much. We're very appreciative of your time and your expertise. Everyone take care and be well. Thank you so much. Thank you.